It's day four, number 81. With the man Frank Scalish. We're back. We are back live. We have hand-drawn maps today. We have a plethora of photos, major oh. announcements. So we got the whole nine yards today, Frank. How you doing? Well, I'm doing great. And we're going deep today, guys. We're going we're going well, actually, we're going shallow, but we're going deep. <laughs> we're going deep into shallow floating vegetation. Yes, we are. In fact, <laughs> we this is the time of the year, isn't it? All the stuff has grown up. It's matted out. Some of it's died. You've got multiple types of vegetation, coast to coast, mixing yes. vegetation, all sorts of ways to attack it. It's like August and September are probably the two best months for this cross country. Obviously, there are certain parts of the country you can right. ply the trade of vegetation fishing year round, but these are the two yes. months where. The majority of the country has some some sort of floating vegetation that they can tackle. That's true. And as you progress into the fall, the bass actually start to use any type of grass even better as fall gets closer because of the migration of the bait fish. But we'll get into all that. Momentarily. Announcements first. Hit it. Hit us with the announcements. Frank. Okay. First, my son Josh is driving away to college to play baseball. Um, he got a scholarship at Clark in Dubuque, Iowa. Have a safe trip, kid. He's got a long drive ahead of him. Congratulations. <laughs> now, if I remember correctly, when Josh was on BTL about a month ago, mm -hmm. he was he was coming off of of uh, major arm surgery. Tommy yeah. John, right? Yeah, Tommy John surgery. Uh, he was trying to get back into it, but he was he was uh, undecided as to where he would be playing in 2023. So a lot has changed over the past month then. A lot changed, like literally overnight for him. Um, he was going to go to Chattanooga and play post-grad baseball, get a year of baseball under his belt, and then go back to school. And um, the post-grad uh, program had been canceled and so he posted some uh, pitching pictures of himself on Twitter. And the very next day, a coach reached out to him. Well, multiple coaches reached out to him. Um, but this one guy in particular reached out to him and, and gave him a letter of intent. And he took it. And so we went from not knowing what the heck we were going to do to – Hurry up and pack and get the hell out of here, <laughs> essentially. So good for him. I mean, he worked hard for it, and now let's we'll see what happens. But I get to watch college baseball now, and I'm excited. Isn't that it. every parent's dream is to raise a college athlete that then gets a scholarship to a college? Yes, it is. It is my dream. <laughs> see, my parents kind of got the short end of the stick there because I played college hockey at OU, but it was club hockey. And I had academic scholarships, but club hockey doesn't really do athletic right. scholarships. Thus, the word club in front of it. Right. So they still, they still had to help help with the uh, tuition bill there. Absolutely. So we're congratulations, we're, Frank. Yeah, we're excited and Josh. about that. Exactly. So Josh, have a safe trip. Call me. You know, halfway there. Call me. Anyhow. Um, Remember, guys, the, uh, last Thursday we talked about the uh, Hook 'em for Haley auction. They got a plethora of new products on that auction site from uh, other custom painters, from super high end uh, tackle manufacturers. Um, Waterwood Bates is giving a bunch of stuff into that auction, uh, very expensive handmade wooden baits. Um, you got to check it out, uh, it's still going on. Um, it is still going on. Yes, I think it's today. I think today might be the last day. Or listen, there's some bids on your on your uh, nitro jersey and your original elite series jersey up there. You have two jerseys that are for for auction on the Hook'em for Haley auction. It's literally if you just go to Facebook, if you're on your regular Facebook account and in the search bar, you just type in no spaces Hook'em for Haley H A I L Y. Yeah, H A I L Y. Auction. All auction. one word. It literally pops up and then the bidding is just under the comments of each of the of each of the items for sale. So you can scroll down and see. Last time I checked, you had I think you were right around five hundred bucks between the two jerseys, which is awesome. The the nitro one was up to two fifty yeah. and the uh the 
standard elite, jersey. elite yeah. series jersey was up to 200 yeah the weird thing about the weird thing about the i haven't even been on the auction site because i i um i have facebook but i barely ever use it i'm the same way um i i prefer instagram it's quick it's easy um so that's what i do but um I haven't even looked at it, so I don't even know. You know, I don't know where my lures are at. I don't know where anything's at. So but yeah, you can go check that. I know you've got a list. I don't want to. I don't want to get you off course. No, but speaking dude. of Instagram, Frank, We're there's good. one thing that is very hard to hide, and that is <laughs> that is a genuine smile and pure joy. Yeah, dude. And, I swear. and on Frank <laughs> underscore Scalish. <laughs> <laughs> on the on the isn't it the, on the in, on the Instagram? Yes. I'm uh, this morning. I'm scrolling. I said I have not seen Frank smile that big in a long time, and you appeared to be in a functioning bass boat catching smallmouth offshore. Yes, and largemouth too. Um, here's the irony of that: ninety um, percent of the fish came on the fat-free shad, the um, Gen twos, which I wasn't surprised because a month ago that's how I was catching them. But what surprised me was that it was still going on. Now, I went to a different lake. The lake I was on there, I hadn't been on since the spawn and really didn't know what I was going to encounter. And I actually went just to, I picked the lake out because if anything happened to the motor, I needed to be able to get somewhere by trolling motor. Um, so I picked that lake out on purpose because it was big enough I could run and and it had enough play homes around it where if something happened i controlling motor somewhere and and get you know get help if i needed it you're a little shell shock still you're not you're not yeah. fully all in on it no i'm not fully all in and um hence i didn't go to lake erie because I, I really want to go real smallmouth fishing and um but i decided that since it's it was its maiden voyage after m massive surgery that i would um take it easy on the old gal but it felt good to have horsepower under my seat for once instead of living off of my electric motor. You awesome. know what I mean? Yeah, it was a good day. I mean, we caught them. We didn't catch them as good as I hoped, but we, we caught over a dozen and, um, you know, got some good ones. So that was that was a decent, decent day. Fantastic. Now, uh, I want to give a shout out to a, uh, to a friend of mine, Brennan at Do It. Um, I'm doing some things with some of their products uh tinkering as you as you will because you all know i i make things so i got in touch with him because i wanted a few try a few things out and i will elaborate more on this uh at a later date but i wanted to give a shout out to brennan and um you guys remember the diy section on LureNet. we have a lot of blanks um, they're there, they're available for all the guys that want to paint their own lures. Uh, don't miss out because the, uh, Norman blanks, they're, they're, um, authentic production blanks. They are made out of butyrate. They're the exact blanks that, that we paint for the retailers. Um, so you'll, you're getting the actual real McCoys and then, um, check out the paint shop. I did a color a while ago called olive blue. Um, I actually, uh, went in the spring smallmouth fishing and I wrecked them on olive blue, the deep little end. I absolutely massacred them. Um, so that's, you know, it's a good color to get. Uh, it translates really well in a lot of different water conditions. So check it out. If you like it, buy it. If you don't, don't. There it is. That's the deep baby end. Well, it's this, that's that olive blue color. Yeah, go to the go to the deep little end picture because it'll that one was backlit, so it's it's showing it up as more transparent because they put the light behind it. It's, oh, it, that it's does a, look different. It's a semi-transparent bait, but that one was filmed without backlight, so oh. that's what it really looks like. But it's semi-transparent, so when you have clear water, it has a transparent look to it. But the pearls in that bait will reflect solid in off-colored water because your light penetration is different. It's a really, really cool color because it does a couple of things in the water. So you want to check it out. It's it's uh, it's one of my favorites. That and and the pearl green is good in, in the uh, new fat-free shads. 
I like those colors just because they lend themselves to be, they look solid in different water conditions and look transparent in clear water conditions. It's really a cool paint job. We usually don't go to the instant feedback this early in the show, which depending on how long it takes to get through the floating vegetation, Frank, I did <laughs> maybe yesterday mention that there was a possibility we could open up the Sunline hotlines at the do end it. of the show. Well, let's just let it rip. We'll do the show. Let it rip. If you see something come up and it's, you know, pertinent to what we're talking about, we'll answer it. Uh, well, I mean, I'd have to answer the phone, so I have to get that set up. Oh, so you can phone, either put yeah. it in the comments there. The Sunline Hotline is the is, so we kind of have to have a segment. We could make sure okay, we well, save ten minutes at the end for it. But if you have questions, but this one did perk my interest. Nick Larosa said there were water spouts on Erie this morning and yesterday too. You ever yeah. seen those? You've seen water yeah. spouts on Erie before? Oh yeah. In fact, like a moron, one day I was out there and I saw like four of them. So I had to go see what they were all about. So I. I drove to them. <laughs> I Is got it, very close to them, but not cl cl not close enough to be a moron, but cl close enough to go. That is really wild. Um, and then I, I was actually eating lunch at a restaurant with my wife one day, and we were looking out over the lake, and there were seven of them dancing around downtown Cleveland, all the water spouts. Wow, v I've never very seen cool. them before. Very cool. They're like tornadoes on the water. Well, I've seen some naders. Mm -hmm. they, yeah, they're like tornadoes. They And they pick up the water mist mm -hmm. and funnels it around. It looks just like a funnel cloud. And they just they do move and they dance around on the water. It's kind Is of that wild. where you read those articles every once in a while where someone has some fish that fly down in their front yard that live around lakes? Like yeah, sucked where up I, in the water spout, shot out of the top. Where I used to live, we used to get uh, the little shad. I lived. The lake was literally across the street from my old house, and um, one day it was like raining bait fish in my front yard. I had shad falling everywhere out of the sky. It was the craziest thing. They were little, you know, mm, two inches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But dude, it was like they were they were like, going, dude, there's a fish, there's another fish. You know what I'm saying? Oh, it's it was crazy. Wild. Then you look down and there's a toad bleeding out of his eyes. The apocalypse has started. <laughs> My grass was really <laughs> green that year. <laughs> That's like that would be a heck of a time mowing the yard. Then just a just a shad mulch oh, yeah. <laughs> covering the neighborhood. <laughs> My grass was really green and vibrant that year. And that's how they invented bait fuel. Uh, <laughs> that's right. That's how they invented it. All right. We got anything else before we uh, before we tackle the greenery? No, nah, we can do that, man. We can do whatever. It's... All right. Your show. How do you want to kick her off? All right. Well, um, let me think a second on this. Why don't you put the illustration up? first the, the illustration because the first vegetation we're going to talk about and it is a true floater is water hyacinth so i had to do this illustration for bass masters uh magazine and those are hyacinths water hyacinths they are actually true floaters their roots don't adhere to anything they just hang below the actual plant and they float around in the current and the wind um, so let's do, let's go, I'm going to bounce a little. Let's go pull the real water chestnut picture up with the root bag on it. Chestnuts? I mean, no, not chestnuts, hyacinths. All right. Hyacinths. You could tell this is a well-structured morning. <laughs> okay. That's what they actually look like in living color. Okay. Um, now, now go to, do I have a root system on a water chestnut? By any chance. Describe that, by the way. It's it's literally okay. looks like a like a for the iTunes listeners. I'm trying to think. It looks like it, it looks like one of those plants you can get for like nine ninety nine when you're in the doghouse at the grocery store that comes in like a little potted plant that you're like, right. oh, I'll pick up a live plant and bring it home. That'll make things hunky dory. Right, exactly. So what you have, you have a uh, a kind of a roundish leaf on top of a bulb, basically, yeah. and then. Th the root cluster is beneath that. But and it doesn't we, attach to anything. It just no. takes nutrients from the water. Exactly. It is a true free-floating water vegetation. It's truly, it moves by wind, by current, 
tide, boat traffic, etc. Those are those are hyacinths in the water. Once they're once they're grown out, then they have a little purple flower on them. They have some, but those things are just they're just in the wind, just blowing with the wind. Yeah, so here, so, okay, so it, water high sinks, it's a true floater. Um, it spreads and grows. So what this plant does, just so you guys, I'm going to just briefly, I'm not going to do this with every piece of vegetation, but but this one in specifically because it's probably the most common that you'll run into. Um, it, it grows. It has this thing come, called a stolen. It's a little, like a little foot that comes out of the bottom of it. And it starts to grow another plant on that foot, okay? And then what, what happens is it will break free from the original plant and then become its own little plant and then start to get bigger and mature and then, you know, spread it out itself. So what happens is with, because as I said, these are true floating, this is true floating vegetation. So, so what happens is wind, tide, current boat traffic breaks up these big mats and it causes uh, portions of these mats to start to drift away, thus spreading the plants to more areas of the lake, which is why this stuff spreads so feverishly because it it's predicated totally on the environment and it pushes it around. So let's say you let's say you have a uh, you have a north facing pocket, and you have a south wind, and the lake has floating hyacinths in it, you probably can say, well, I bet you if I go into that pocket, there's going to be a pile of hyacinths back there, if that's what you're fishing. Mm -hmm. And and then you can go there and you can play the wind game. You could run all the pockets that have wind in them, or conversely, you could run all the pockets that have zero wind in them. Because it, the the vegetation that's lodged in these other pockets the calmer the pocket the vegetation will stay put doesn't move around as much and don't forget the bigger the mats get the harder it is for them to move so they they stay put these broken ones that you're seeing in this picture here floating around in in the all over the place they were broken up by the wind dislodged and they're drifting free floating they'll lodge up and lock in somewhere else eventually and then become habitat the next plant we're going to talk about well, is we got water. do we got to oh. show what it looks like once they lock in though oh do i have one that? absolutely oh yeah good yeah okay there you go that's all locked in and but it's you, all still free floating there's nothing nothing attaching those no. that entire mile long mat to the bottom anything there's nothing attaching it to the bottom now here's a good sign you know that's you know that's locked in because two things there's other grass on the outside edges of it and you have duckweed around the corners of it okay so you know that particular mat's not going anywhere it's staying put now some of the fingers on the ends of it might break off due to boat traffic or wind but the main mat itself is staying put here's what i'm going to do i'm going to talk about a few more types of vegetation and then i'm going to tell you exactly how to break it down with a blink of an eye to save time because anybody that's seen two miles of grass knows that it's a it's a holy crap moment when you see that because you're like what a, oh my where am I gonna start? It's intimidating. It's very intimidating. So we're gonna I'm gonna do all that after I talk about the vegetation. So here so here before we go to any other pictures, here's what we're talking about: water hyacinth, uh, water chestnut, pennywort, gator grass, duckweed lily pads now i didn't put any pictures of lily pads in there because everybody knows what a lily pad is and then we'll talk about some matted grass things and you know that matted grass can be floating vegetation or it could be a hydrilla milfoil coontail you know any grass that gets gnarly and matted on top even you know all the grasses that we that i just mentioned will mat Okay, so the next one I want to talk about is water chestnut, because here's the deal. 
Water chestnut, I've seen guys confuse the two, even though they look vastly different. Uh, that's a water chestnut. Now, here's what happens with water chestnuts. It's not a free-floating vegetation, but it is a floater. The stems and the leaves are hollow, and they're designed to float. However, the root system, the root system on on a chestnut can grow literally 12 to 15 feet deep. So the, those chestnuts could be over deep water as their root systems adhere to the bottom and the chestnuts start to spread out. They will adhere to the bottom and you can be over some serious water with these things. Is this your hand in this photo here, Frank? Yeah. You like my um, nail polish? <laughs> it's this new color I was testing out. It's a it's a new color called Distressed Chad. <laughs> yeah, it's called Distressed Frank. So <laughs> I just noticed that it's it's, it's called Friday Night. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so this stuff spreads by seeds, which is the water chestnut itself um, that people will eat. It, it, it's the seed pod that spreads it. Now these seed pods, they're triangular and pointy on all different sides and they float um the seed pod and this one is right where you're at right there and right above it yes so what happens is when those seed pods start to mature they break off the plant and they float mm. and the, and they can be viable for 15 years wow not not to eat in 15 years but to regrow so oh, wait they, a second. People eat this right here. Yeah, that's the water chestnut. Like when you go get, you know, Chinese food and it's full of water chestnuts. Oh, those are the things I always tell them to take out. The the white, the, yeah. they're, they look like a scallop, except they're odd. They're, they don't. Yeah, they yeah. taste like styrofoam. Yeah, no, I'm not a water chestnut fan, but I know what I'm talking. That's what that is right there. Yeah, that, that seed that pot is. is the water chestnut. Right. Now, you I guys. unaware of that. Don't harvest these and eat them until you know exactly which water chestnut plant you're looking at. Please. That's a good disclaimer. Yeah, because there's multiple different types of water chestnut. So anyway, so these things will float around. They'll they'll lodge in somewhere near the bank, start to sprout, float free, send a root system down, lock on the bottom, and then they just start spreading like mad. Now here's the crazy thing. It's an in, it's an invasive species. That's Lake Champlain, guys. Lake Champlain is getting inundated with these things. Absolutely. It's absolutely terrible. Um, they grow like mad. So um, you're going to start to see them all over the place. <clears throat> the first time I ever came in contact with a water chestnut was on the Hudson River in one of my first seasons in Bassmasters. Um, I didn't know what the heck they were, and I had pulled into this pocket, and it was loaded with these things, <clears throat> so I started fishing them, really didn't quite get an understanding of what was going on yet, and then the tide, on the Hudson River, the tide was like four feet, four and a half feet. And so I was a little panicky the farther in the backwaters I got. I was a little panicky because if the tide came out, I would not be able to get out of the backwater. So I was very cautious. I wound up fishing that tournament, mostly main river stuff, um, basically because of, you know, my fear of the unknown at the time. Well, once I got it dialed in, I wasn't worried anymore because then I knew how to time the tide and I knew all the stuff mm -hmm. about the tide and i'm going to tell you how to fish these vegetations in a minute all right so we've got the <clears throat> hyacinth we've got the water chestnut right the next grass is going to be people call it gator grass it's really called alligator weed but it's gator grass to me too uh now this particular type of vegetation actually grows from the bank so it roots itself in the bank and then grows out from the bank and so it is rooted, okay? And it creates a canopy, but it's connected to land. It actually grows in the shallow water and land. 
and spreads out over the top of the water. Now, if anybody has ever um, fished gator grass, this stuff is like cable. It yeah. is the hardest thing to break free when you snag on it. It is absolutely the strongest vegetation I've ever flipped a lure into. Okay. Uh, th this, you got to be ready that when you're fishing this stuff, you got to have the equipment to fish it because you will be, it will be very sad. If you this don't. stuff has broke my heart a couple of times in Florida on day. Oh, two. you know it, dude, you know it. So, so here's the deal with this stuff. This stuff spreads like mad because how it spreads is if a stem breaks off, if a leaf pod breaks off, it regenerates from the broken grass mm -hmm. particles. So every part of this plant literally can grow. So, so when you, you know, you run it over and you chop it up into a million pieces, essentially what you just did was put a million new plants out there. I got um, you. so this stuff, it's very, it's a big nuisance. Um, but it's a very good, it's a very good punchable, flippable grass and it can be very predictable. So I guess it's almost like an awning on a camper where it's, it's attached exactly. to that and then it continues to grow out that's exactly what it is it's important to know how these types of vegetation do grow because that will tell you pretty much bottom composition depth range what to look for what not to look for and i am going to break this down for you guys so don't All right. you know let's not freak yet the next one is floating pennywort Floating pennywort is not a free floating plant either. This roots to the bottom. Um, the crazy thing about pennywort is it is like, I don't know how to describe this, but it is like the stuff, it's like grows on steroids. This stuff can this stuff can double its biomass in three to seven days. I mean, this is the fastest growing plant besides hydrilla on the planet. I mean, this, this stuff can go, um, it's roots. It grows out. The, the roots lodge down shallow. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's what we're talking about. Bottom composition. This roots in shallow mud and then spreads out from there. So when you see pennywort, you're almost guaranteed the bottom's going to be mud, okay? Now, as it canopies out, because the roots can grow long, as it canopies out, the bottom composition can change where the roots can't get anymore. So that's important to know because you want to be punching this stuff with the right bottom composition. Just because you see pennywort doesn't mean you're going to have the right bottom composition because this stuff can literally grow in four inches of water. Yes. I'd never seen this stuff before I went to Neely Henry for the Bassmaster Open. Mm -hmm. Made the final day cut there. Everyone wants to think I made it on a little crankbait and a drop shot, which I did. But on day one, I started on pennywort. Yeah. I started flipping it, punching it. But I... It was weird because there were, there's this whole areas with pennywort, right? But there okay. were like three little sections of it. And every time I went in practice, I shook one off and I went back there in the tournament. I caught one in it. A guy came in behind me. He caught one in it. I went back to it. I missed one. I caught another one. And I couldn't understand why there were only two or three little patches of pennywort in this stuff. And it was a muddy bottom. I had to have a my trolling motor up all the way. It was yep. maybe a foot and a half, two feet deep. And for the life of me, I could not figure out how the fish were swimming, navigating, and living underneath this stuff that yeah. even when it went through, it hardly went to the bottom. But you'd pitch in there, you'd shake it, and the penny wart would move around and it'd go donk. You can go right. back and watch the video. You can go back and watch the video of the of the penny wart that I had. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, and the reason that you were catching them only in a few areas is because in those areas, 
the bottom composition probably changed or you probably had a depth difference right in those areas. Uh, maybe there was a little faster dip off the edge of that pennywort because a lot of pennywort grows super shallow. So only as it starts to expand its way off the bank will you start to get water underneath pennywort. For the most part, if you, you see it right up against the bank, you pitch in there, it's probably only, you know, eight inches deep. So you got to pay attention. You, you always have to pay attention to um, where you're getting the bites and why you're getting a bite there. You know what I mean? Are you looking for your video? Yeah, I'm trying to find it. All right. So I'll keep talking while you look for it. Yeah, keep going. So, so that's, that's what you have to pay attention to, um, on the pennywort thing. The first time I encountered pennywort, it was sloppy, shallow, mucky, muddy, and I had zero success in it. Later on, when I found that stuff, I found that I can parallel it with a quarter round spinner bait and get the boat right up on the edges and slow roll that little spinner bait down the sides of it. And I can get the bass that were in the, were the bottom petered out a little bit and the bass could tuck in there for shelter i can get them because okay. i was making these long casts paralleling this stuff and i can cover massive amounts of water that way huh. and, and so what so what i do then is i say okay i caught one here and i caught one there and then you know that where you caught that fish something was different in that massive stretch that looks exactly the same something was different and you can key in on those areas and what i would do is i would key in on them i would start six feet before i got the bite and fish six feet after just in case they were milling around in there but most of the time i got my other bites in the same places just like matt said earlier do you want to see this penny work yeah I, do, that I, I was do. doing i'm interested in you breaking it down i don't know if i could break it down but okay I so see, see how it. it's like an isolated penny work matt and i got no audio on this that's okay but i'm just like working it in there and i'm not exactly sure what's up Boom, right in the middle of the... See, what, look how yeah, far back I am in that penny I wart. I do see that. And there here, there it comes in. I mean, that was a good one for that. Oh, yeah. And then, uh, let's get keep going back in the penny wart. But see, uh, there's some different... But there it is right there, see? Yeah. How it's, it's doing the same thing, but there's like little groups of it out here. There, I'm talking to a guy about how much I suck. So here's another one. Watch how far back in I'm casting this stuff in the penny wart. Way back in there, Frank. And I'm not understanding what's underneath here, but look, little hollow balls. Boom, he hit it. See, he moved it way back in the penny wart. Okay, I'm going to tell you exactly what you're looking at. You see how that's an open hole in the yep. penny wart? You know penny wart grows in the mud, right? Yeah. So the open hole has to be a hard bottom where the penny wart won't root. And the other thing is, if you see how the penny wart comes out, it's telling you exactly how that high spot's coming out. It's it's telegraphing that that underwater point that comes out there. right here. Yes. And so, so there's it, a little bit deeper water and harder bottom right where that fish was sitting. Correct. It could it could be a foot difference, but it's a harder bottom because the penny wart's not growing there. That's the one thing about pennywort. If you see that and you see the holes in it, you know the bottom composition is hard because they like to grow in the mud. It's actually, it grows in shallow mud and on shallow mud flats. And so that's what you want to concentrate on. That's a really, I'm glad you pulled that up because that's money. So here's something else, okay? So you remember that right now. Um, you, you remember how that looks. If you were to go in there in the spring, okay? Mm -hmm before the penny work grows, you would know where that hard spot is and you can throw a rattle bait on it or a square bill on it in the spring or a chatter bait. And you could, you could literally key in on that small, you know, eight foot circle of clearness in there. Okay. That's a and close that, up of it. Yeah. That's a close up of penny work. So that's why I went down an entire bank for an hour of nothing but penny wart, and the only bite I had was reeling my bait in at the edge of the penny wart. I had one that just mauled it, and I missed it. So yeah. I punched the penny wart all the way down there, and all I was punching was mud bottom with root on it. I wasn't finding any variation in it, so I basically wasted an hour of my day because I did not understand right. how the type of vegetation that I was fishing grew, where it grew, and what I needed to be keen Ex on. Exactly, and we're going to get into that in a minute. Okay. Um, that's exactly right, dude. That is, that's what, look, it's, uh, it's important to, 
as a fisherman, it's important to know about your environment and what you're coming in contact with. Um, like when we did the other vegetation show, we talked about the same thing. This grass grows in sand. This grass grows here. This grass grows there. This grass can grow deep. You know what I mean? It's important to know those things because that helps you break down these massive grass flats at faster, way faster. Now, uh, another true, true floater that does not put roots in the ground. It literally floats with the wind in the current and does whatever it wants is duckweed. Okay. Um, duckweed is mostly found in protected pockets, sloughs, oxbows, backwater. That's their root system right there. Essentially you're looking at a tiny little plant. Sometimes they look like a little clover and their root system is, you know, four to six inches long, microscopic almost. Huh. It's like hair. And they float around, and that's the stuff you always, you know, dream of when you have a hollow-bodied frog, and you see that duckweed, and you that frog makes its little path through the duckweed. You know how you see all the frog marks going through mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, that that's kind of what you dream of because there's really nothing stopping that fish from coming up through that stuff. It's it's literally a thin layer of nothingness. So. It's not like fishing, you know, hydrilla or milfoil where the mat could be this thick and you got to pound that thing through there to get to the canopy. Now, this is the duckweed. Now, see if you notice it, it's always going to be duckweed is always going to be concentrated in very protected areas because it's so it's so susceptible to wind current. Duckweed will blow wherever the wind blows. One day you might be fishing on one side and the duckweed's all over there. The next time you come back, you have a wind change, all the duckweed's on the other side. So you just got to be cognizant of that. I did it's, not know that it had a root structure underneath it. Yeah, it's very small. It's a very tiny little so, microscopic root uh, system. Is this a bad comparison? But if the, if the uh, hy hyacinth is the pit bull or mastiff of that this is like a teacup poodle version of if you're to name uh, oh it yeah dog. this it's like this, this is just kind of the same thing except it's a lot you you can actually do stuff with this grass instead of just punch through it yeah in fact when i see that i don't normally punch it unless it's got multiple types of vegetation sticking mm -hmm. out of the water um that's really when i'm punching i don't punch duckweed because you know, there's nothing to punch underneath it. It's no, there, there's no, there's nothing. Toad style baits, hollow bodied frogs, like pad crashers and stuff like that. That's what that that's when you can just fly down and cover water. And the beauty part about it is you can see all your tracks. So, you know, where you're casting at and, you know, stuff like that. Um, duckweed's really easy to fish. Um, I've had some times when I go out there where I'm on a definite duckweed pattern and I've had times when I go out there and just, if I see the duckweed and I'm fishing somewhere, I fish the duckweed too. You know what okay. I mean? Just in case, because it's overhead cover. It offers, it offers a slight canopy, giving it shade, giving the bass overhead protection. And it's not a very choked out vegetation. <laughs> It doesn't get mad. To go back to the hyacinth, then, and you pointed this out in the first vegetation on this photo, there appears to be a, a edge of duckweed on the outside. Correct. Um, which obviously, because if that's blown in there, because you said that the hyacinth are true floating vegetation, you'll Correct. often see the hyacinth and the duckweed together. But because the duckweed is lighter, it's going to the hyacinth is going to create a wall. The that's hyacinth correct. can be difficult to fish. So that's why the duckweed on the edge of hyacinth is often a very viable pattern that you see guys catch fish on. Absolutely. 100%. Because it offers them um, a little more freedom of movement. Um, they can get under the hyacinths, though. I mean, I've had some incredible punching days on that mm -hmm. crap right there. Um, so I guess, I guess, you know, you know, a, you know, a, a fast, the fast breakdown is, you know, you know, what to look for, how to fish it, what to fish in it, how the tide affects it. Let me talk about tide for a quick second, if I can. Um, when I mentioned the Hudson River and the massive tide there, the farther north you go, the bigger the tide. Hudson River was about four and a half foot tide. You go farther north, the tide can be eight to 12 feet. So, so 
here's what happens with these vegetations. As the tide goes in, the vegetation starts to spread out. It gets open, okay? The fish will go way up underneath it, way up underneath it. So when I'm on a tidal river, I like to fish the, the, the punch the mats on a falling tide because all the fish in the back start to make their move <clears throat> to the deeper water out to the front of the mat. Okay. So now what's happening is I'm getting fish positioned. I'm getting more fish positioned within a small flip of range. So now I don't have to go way back to no man's land where you got a push pole to get to where the bank starts to drop. Because as the tide goes up, you could that's where the bass are going. As the tide falls, the bass are coming out. So that's going to lead me to let me find one of my drawings here. That's going to lead me to well here, I'll do this one first because it's simple. So so you have Am I on screen? I can't see. You're perfect. Okay. So as you see here, you have the bank that drops off the bank. Yeah. It, it forms a dip. Then you have a high spot. And then you have the creek channel. And then it peters out. Okay. You have your mats across the top. Maybe you got some open water pockets. Okay. As if this was high tide, there would be more water over this. Mm -hmm. So essentially, it would look like this spot right here. Okay, over here, as the tide falls, you see the fish have to be positioned right here. Yep. Right. Very high percentage spot on a low tide or a falling tide. Yep. So that's the place I'm going to concentrate. The other place I'm going to look for is high spots. If you know where the high spots are, you know where the high percentage places are, because you're going to look at this from an aerial view. There's it's going to be a, a massive mat on over here. So by knowing what your bottom contours are is how you're going to break these mats down. So now what I did was I took a fictitious pocket, okay, and I drew. It's beautiful. Can you, see the, can you see the whole thing? Yeah, I lifted up just a tad. Yeah, that's fantastic, Fred. Okay, so what I have here is I have a high spot here. I have a hard bottom point here. I have some sharp drop offs here mm -hmm. sharp drop offs here okay now if you notice what i did was i just picked out all the high percentage places by a structure by a contour map so if this whole thing was matted vegetation with maybe the exception of the creek arm here okay mm -hmm. i know that this is my first spot i'm going to look at right here because i know that point has rocks on it just because the grass is over it and you can't see that, that's money, okay? You got deep water access, hard bottom rocks. Next place I'm going to go straight to is this high spot right here because this high spot gets the bass to get underneath that canopy and not have so much water above their head, mm -hmm. okay? It's structure. They want the structure. They're going to find that structure under the grass. They're not, we're not, the, the grass doesn't exist. We're structure fishing. The grass is an afterthought. Same thing with this point here, hard bottom points. You got a nice deep edge on it. So what's going to happen is your mat probably won't start to grow until it starts to flatten out over here. Okay. And that makes this a really high percentage spot. Uh, just like, the penny war point you were fishing, Matt. It, it'll come out, it'll form a point, and you'll see a point of grass on it. There might be a hole here. There might be a hard spot, bottom spot here. There might be a hole here. You don't know until you get there. The other high percentage area is sharp breaks on the edge of the grass, the sharp breaks. And, and I like turns. I like anywhere the channel is going to make a turn because that's different in the break line. You follow me? Oh yeah, I follow you. This is I'm actually chuckling over here, Uncle Frank, and you can't see it. I can't I'm see it because there's continue with your map, but it it totally explains how I caught him on Sam Rayburn in 2020, and I was figuring out why the hell am I catching him punching this hydrilla mat and not the others? Well, you just described it on the map, Frank. Right, because everything I do in this world of fishing is based on structure first, cover second. 
And that's how you <clears throat> that's how you make your put yourself in the best position to catch fish on places that all look the same because on the surface they look the same, but underneath the water there's differences. Okay? Now I'm going to show you something that we encounter all the time and it's daunting. And basically what that is, it's just a giant mat. It's just a giant mat. Like this could be a mile long mat right there. Okay. I, I shortened it up. Am I on screen? Yep. Okay. So I shortened it up. So, so here's what, here's what I do. I have high percentage places here too. Now this could be, let's just say this is nothing more than just a gradual it's a gradual tapering bank. There's no hard structure as far as there's no defined creek channels. It's just a big giant mat, right? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm taking isolated mats off the big mat. Those are the first places I'm going. Same thing as a willow tree that's separate from a line of willows or a bush that sticks out further in a, in a flooded fishing scenario. 100%. I think now, Bradley Hallman calls them condos. Right. Those are the highest percentage places. Now, the other thing is there's probably deeper water out here than there is up here. Okay, so that's going to be the deepest water. Then I'm going to look for broken vegetation. Maybe it's not matted, but it's all broken up. Okay, the high percentage spot in front of the mat. The next place that I'm going to look at is points of grass that come out that make definitive points of grass. Because that's something different. That's like, treat it like a point of a landmass, okay? That's a funnel area. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the inside turns and swings. Because, again, it's different. It's So it's just like a river channel. It comes in, makes a turn, makes a swing. <laughs> it, same thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why yeah, are no. you laughing at me? I can't Watch this. Put, put your, put your uh, deal down for a second. I can't Watch see this. So you just you just described that, right? Right. So 2020 Sam Rayburn open. And I I can't figure out why in this one section, this one section of Rayburn, I always got bit. I shook him off in practice. And it okay. looked the worst. It wasn't the thickest, but it had clumps and there was a little creek channel and it was on the swing of a creek channel. Hold on. Let me see. <laughs> what nothing i'm just laughing because i got a punch and video too coming yeah, up yeah yeah we'll, we'll, we'll run the, yours but it's the watch, day of the videos watch this okay so see it doesn't look that great but look i'm in open water here right that right. is the map hold that's the map you just held up right there so i am on that edge that you're talking about where it's a little different and watch I'm pitching out into like the open water. Now, ignore the fact that this fish was on for 25 seconds before I decided to set the hook. <laughs> but this is exactly what you just described, right? Exactly. Look where he's coming out. He's coming off of the edge. It was a hard bottom. There were isolated clumps out here. And boom. 100%, dude. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. That's, I love that's, that. that. I love it when you explain things that I don't understand. But you did understand it because you caught fish there. Yeah, but so, I didn't really understand why there nowhere else. <laughs> but it was right where, right where the, yeah, right where you're pointing. So so now so because we're now we're gonna get into the mat a little bit. Okay, we've already done all this high percentage stuff, and we probably caught fish out here. But now we're gonna go into the mat. So there's an open hole back there. That open hole is telling me two things. One of two things. Different bottom composition, probably hard because nothing's growing on it, or it's a deeper hole. Okay, so this is something that I would go look at. The next thing I'm going to look at is where the mat changes color, where it's all cheesed up, and this might be brown or it might be bright yellow, these areas here. That's where the mat's going to be at its thickest I'll concentrate on these color changes because I found where the bass will con they'll conjugate around this stuff. These they'll conjugate or congregate. Congregate. Is it conjugate? Me. Yes, it I means like that. that. <laughs> it means that. 
We had another we had another Freudian <laughs> slip, boys and girls. They is will this, concentrate around those. This things. is a great time to queue up your video, right? Yeah, let's queue it up. Because this is even a better a better example. So in this particular video, the 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 main thing that I was looking for was depth. I needed depth underneath the grass. Not all the grass had the depth on it. So what I have here is I have an isolated patch of matted grass. That's this what I'm circling right here. Correct. I got the different color cheese on it right there. Yeah, little. This is kind of yellowish green, deeper green. Yeah, I got two or three okay. different types of cheese. The key here for me on this particular day was I had to have this stuff growing over five to seven feet of water. Okay. That was the whole key. And I did not catch them anywhere else but in that okay. kind of stuff. Multiple types of vegetation, as we discussed. Absolutely. Uh, hard edge right here, which shows that there's a bottom composition change or else this correct. stuff would be growing out there. That is correct. So here's what I did. So I, I, I started flipping my way around. And if you notice, I'm flipping my way around that different colored uh, type of grass patch. I'm flipping all the way around it because what I what I learned was the fish were around that, not necessarily in it, but around it. And so it was real easy for me to go down the lake and focus on this stuff because I just all I did was concentrate on that. And I wound up I caught so many. I caught probably 20 or 30 that day, um, just focusing on where it gets real heavy on top and fishing around the heavier matted stuff. Um, and so, and this, it's really deceiving cause it's really deep. I'm, I'm shaking that thing to get it down there. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then there you go. And, you know, I mean, they're sloppy fish when you get on them good, they're sloppy. So much, such a better, more hook set than me. Oh, I did, checked it, checked it again. Let him swim over to his legs. <laughs> he just wanted to say, Hey, so let him see who's around. Yeah. <clears throat> But With yeah, the I mean, scoop. yeah, because the scoop is right. But the, wow. you know, but but that's the that's the whole deal with punching grass. It's all about figuring out the differences that you need to look for and okay. concentrating on those differences. So let's go back to the let's go back to the flip where you got bit, right? Because mm -hmm. I noticed there's okay, there it is, right there, real short flip, boom, okay. So you put the bait right here. You have all this different cheese you can put, but you put the bait right here where you got bait. Is that because there's some sort of little bowl or difference in this grass right here, so you wanted to put it right at the edge because there was a transition right there, or are you just randomly going down the edge, no. or was there a reason why you because, put it right there? Because earlier in the day, I figured out that the fish were about a foot or so in from the edge. Okay. And if I fished on the outside of the edge... I didn't catch them. So I put the, put the bait about a foot or so from the edge of the mat because the bass were in the mat a little ways, but they weren't buried way up in the mat. And so that's what I did because by, by your arrow, your handprint, there's broken vegetation out here that you can see in front of me right there. Yep. It's all broken up. It's not quite matted down yet. You know what I mean? And so they were using that mat as cover, but dashing out to the open water if they had to, to catch something. So I put it right over top of their head, right where they were sitting. But mm -hmm. I had figured this out earlier in the day. And so it was, I wound up doing, uh, I was punching different baits. Um, and so what I, what I wound up doing was I had to do quick tips on each bait, uh, what I was punching. So the first the first bait I actually uh, punched was the Christy Craw. Whoa, was the the Yum Christy Craw? Mm -hmm. That was the first bait I punched. And I told um, my son was filming this for me this day. I told him I said we're going to catch one on each of these baits and do some quick videos. So I, the first one I did was was the Christy Craw, and then the next one I did was the money craw, which is, this is my, actually one of my favorite punching baits right here is the young um, money craw because it goes through really nice. It, it, it doesn't snag up on a lot of things. Just the design of this bait right here really 
lends itself well to punching. And then um, another really good punching bait, like when you get all the slimy stuff, you know how you get that slime on the water? Mm -hmm. um, when I see a lot of slime, I'll go to the, the woolly bug and I'll punch the woolly bug because it goes through the slime really effortlessly. Okay. It just, it's just so streamlined that it just goes right through it without gunking up. Same thing with the money craw. If you see how the money craw shape is, it really lends itself well to going through stuff. So, so my number one punch bait is right here. The money craw, I would say this is probably number two. If I need wilder action, I go to the Christie craw or the spine craw, depending on what kind of action the fish want <clears throat> these are this is fast and tight this is wild and crazy this is slow and methodical this thing looks like one of them blow up dolls you see at the gas station you know when they blow the things up and the wind blows them and they dance around those what type of gas things. station are you going to uncle frank you know what i'm talking about <laughs> yeah He's i do bigger. That's the what crazy that's, wind guy. They right. would put the generator and yeah. shoot it up and say, but I use cars guy. here. Right. So this is the crazy wind guy. This is super tight, fast claw action. This is wild. You know, it flaps. Yeah. And it's wild. And this is super subtle and nothing. And it comes right through the slime. It just yeah. peek right through it. So those are basically, these are, these are the four, um, punch and base right. that i that all I right use. just run through it then you're gonna go three eighths to an ounce and a quarter tungsten with them depending on what it takes to get through yeah depending on what it takes to get through um three eighths if it's really broken um i don't really get crazy um my go-to size is three quarters uh that's my go-to size if i can't get through with a three quarter i'll go to ounce or ounce and a quarter Okay. Um, I'm not a, I'm not a guy that's going to, you're not going to see me flipping an ounce and a half. Um, I just, I just don't punch with an ounce and a half braid. Always braid. I use, I use 50 pound braid and no, no leader on it. Straight braid to hook. Um, the reason being is there's so much grass, so much stuff going on underwater. The bass don't know that that's line. Yep. Bobber stop always a bobber stop heavier sinker i'll use two bobber stops it's a good tip uh ewg or straight shank i go with a ewg style hook okay. i don't punch with a straight shank i personal don't I, I i never have it's personal preference um the thing i hate about a straight shank hook is once the bait starts getting off the shank it stays off the shank and in the butt and I don't like that. I that drives me mental. Just heavy flipping stick, nothing crazy. Seven, oh, six, I, no, I heavy. got a, <clears throat> I got a Powell eight oh six, eight footer, eight, eight foot six pound. It's a heavy machine, dude. I mean, you were hammering those fish, and then just there is. I mean, that you had to fight that one because it came out and you had the camera. But as far as in there, I mean, you weren't fighting it. You just wench those suckers out after you said. Oh that. yeah, and the hook set wasn't mental either. I just yeah. leaned back on them. Um, you don't have to crack them with the, the rod I use. I don't have to crack them. I just got to lean up on them and I got them. Yeah. All right. Uh, something that I noticed that a lot of the good punchers seem to do <clears throat> that I think a lot of people might struggle with. Uh, and you haven't brought it up. And it was, a, <laughs> it was a little it was a little movement that you did there that I that I think was was critical. And was it my double you... pump? No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Double pump. All right, here's the video. What What do you notice that you do right here? There's the bite for the flip. What'd I you just do? I gave it line. Watch what 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 Uncle Frank does in with his reel before he engages the reel that allows for a true fall in the mat instead of a slow angled fall. Hundred percent. Watch this right here, right here, right there. And now his reel's engaged. He just gave himself four foot of line, so that bait's going choo, straight down, right? Creating a oh, generating a strike. Hundred percent. Good call, dude. Good get. Right there. Yeah, I do. And then see, you just let it fall straight, and boom, that generated the strike. That fish saw that bait fall past him, went down. You hopped it once. He ate it. You scratched your neck, and then you gave him the beads. <laughs> That was my tell. <laughs> you gave him the beans. 
but no, even the that. even the hook set on there with that 806 even the hook set was uh, you don't have to kill them that rod has got a nice soft tip to it but it is all backbone i mean watch the rod load up right there it's just all backbone i mean it's not you know josh josh i took josh punch in there after that and he short lined one he had like four feet of line out it went through the mat the fish took it he dropped to the floor and set the hook on it and broke the 50 pound braid he thought he had uh, sturgeon and uh, i was laughing i said dude what are you thinking what are you thinking man i said you got zero stretch <laughs> and you just tried to take a four pounder and <laughs> throw him into the moon <laughs> i like it what else calls man let's get some callers are we going to open up the Sunline hotline? We are opening it up. <laughs> All right. Let's I know I have, to, I have to mute the music. I have to pause that. Get the PC rolling. Open up. You got a lot to do, man. You got a thing. You this. Gotta... Go over to the banners. You need to be like an octopus. You need Drop the Sunline. I know. I always used to see Jeffries over here, and I was like, look at this hot shot, pretending like he's messing with seven monitors. And he really is. <laughs> Yet he uh, is. <laughs> the Sunline, if you have a question for uh, Uncle Frank or comment or whatever, uh, we'll open it up uh, if you just want to deliver it. Bloviate. 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 I thought it was deliverate. <laughs> That's not even a word. <laughs> you just want to bloviate the Sunline hotline number four, Uncle That's Frank. Correct. Now, remember, when you call in, uh, you'll be able to hear me and converse with me, but uh, with Frank, you, you, Frank will be able to hear the question. He will not be, you will not be able to hear his response on there. So you get one shot at this. It's like punch it into a mat. You get one shot, fish bites in the initial fall. So ask your question, hang up, and then or, or comment or whatever. And then yeah, Frank and I'll, will, I'll give you a second to hang up so you can hear. Yeah, Frank will take it off here. The Sunline hotline number is 405-253-5543. Now, wanna... I got I got to start I started using Sunline. Um I used to use Silver Thread fluorocarbon. It's been discontinued a number of years ago, but I had a pretty good stock of it. And I started running out of some of my lower pound test line fluorocarbon. The stuff that I use more change a lot more like you know eight to 12 pound eight to 14 um started using it because i i change it i change that out almost every other time i use it my 17 and 20 um i'll i'll use it for a while before i switch it out now if i was in competition i would change it before every tournament but mm -hmm. i'm not doing that anymore so i i get a little more life out of it. So I was running out and I started looking at all different lines uh, to use. And I get a lot of questions. I get a lot of DMS on, Hey, what line do you like? And you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and I told one guy, he responded probably a month or so ago. I said, well, I'm in the process of experimenting with fluorocarbons because I'm, I'm switching over and I'm not a hundred percent sure where I'm going. So um, I, what I did was Frankie made a list for me of all the fluorocarbons out there and their line diameters, because for cranking, I want line diameter. I want a, the same line diameter that I'm used to using. So I know exactly how deep my baits go. So he put this big list together with all the manufacturers and it turns out Sunline had a fluorocarbon that was, identical line diameters to silver thread so i started using that and so far so good i haven't i haven't um encountered any issues with it good knot strength i haven't been breaking fish off so 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 far i'm starting to make that transition over to sunline right now all right we have a caller on the sunline hotline hey you're on with matt and uncle frank who are we talking with yeah, Matt, uh, this is Maynard. Uh, I'm giving you a call. I haven't talked to you for a long time. How's retired life treating you, Maynard? Uh, right now, not too good. My pond uh, had a fish kill in it, so I don't uh, haven't uh, been able to go too much. And uh, the ratio went through, and we had a flooded basement, so I haven't had much time. Jeez. Uh, I'm calling because I sent an email to Uncle Frank. Uh, I watched the show the other day about uh, him talking about uh, life-saving procedures on Lake Erie. And I think it's very important that maybe you guys could do a show on uh, 
um, things to do for big waters like Lake Erie, uh, Champlain, all these big water things, Oahu and all these. Uh, I uh, thought, uh, you know, very interesting about the um, um, nets that he put out, you know, to slow the boat down. Yep. But also about other things on there. Uh, I know when we fished Lake Erie, I've mentioned this to Frank in the email, uh, we had the great big uh, May West uh, life preservers on board. Uh, we had uh, information to be able to get the hold of the Coast Guard and uh, all kind of things like that. And I just thought it was a, a great deal when he was talking about the uh, drift socks that uh, it'd be great to have a show devoted to the safety procedures, uh, things to do on the boat and on the big water that maybe a lot of people listening uh, don't know about. Thank you, Maynard. That's a great uh, that's a great idea. I think maybe we've we've touched on that, Frank, in a past show. Yeah, we skimmed it. We're going to... Yeah, uh, I, hope, uh, I hope later on he can maybe have a show on that. Will do. All right. Thank you, Maynard. Yep. Take care. All right. Continue. All right. Well, Maynard, we, we are going to do a show with that where I'm going to do a Drift Sock show specifically. And within that Drift Sock show, we will have safety tips. All right. Let's... Uh... Let's go back to the Sunline Hotline. Hey, you're on with Matt and Uncle Frank. Who are we talking with? This is Kermit from St. Louis, Missouri. What's I up, gonna Kermit? I going to ask Uncle Frank. In my area, I fish the Ozarks the most, and we don't have any grass. So if you were going to go plan a trip somewhere in the Midwest, what would be the lake to learn the most about grass and have a cool vacation to go for like a week? Thanks. All right, that's a great, great question. Thanks for calling. I would probably look at Gunnersville or Chickamauga. That's a long way from the Midwest. All right, so there uh, is there are, okay. There are a couple good grass lakes in the Ozark area, but I don't. I yeah. really feel like I would get some hate mail if I blew them out. Well, I mean, you know, I'm just thinking of places that actually where you could actually have so many different variations. Fish. You could kind of Google search and also uh, Google Maps and kind of find out on the internet. So, like in Oklahoma, let me say this: like none of the major lakes in Oklahoma are vegetation heavy, especially big tournament lakes, right? Right. But there are a handful of very good grass fisheries in Oklahoma that I have had to seek out and find and learn more about as I have to travel around the country and fish it. But there is milfoil. Mm -hmm. Hydrilla, pads, coontail, water willow. Right. And, 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 and so it might be a smaller body of water that you learn on for grass to go for a week in the Ozark area. I don't know. Maybe someone can chime in on that, but you yeah, might have not, to drive a little bit. You know, I'm not 100% familiar with every body of water in those places. Um, a lot of times, like when I was traveling a lot, fishing all over this country, <laughs> there were lakes that that didn't have grass, you know, 15, 20 years ago that now have it. Um, there's lakes where I live that never had grass that are now yep. actually grass lakes now. You I know what I, I mean? A, yeah, just say, hey, go to this lake. But Yeah, sorry. I wish, I, I mean, I wish I could. The reason that I said Chickamauga and Gunnersville is because that's probably, those are probably the best lakes to actually learn. Yeah, Gunnersville would probably be the best learning lake. Because what happens there is you will have these massive main lake grass flats that literally go miles and miles. But on those main lake flats, you've got secondary channel ditches that run through them. You have so many opportunities and so many things you can experiment with. And not only that, you can get into some of the pockets and creeks on Gunnersville and you can fish traditional style, you know, where you're fishing frogs up against the bank, the grass that's growing on the bank and stuff like that. So there's a lot of you know, when I look at a place, like if I, like when I, when I had to learn how to fish grass, um, it wasn't readily available where I lived. So I found a couple of lakes within a few hours from my house that had grass in them. And I started spending a lot of free time on those lakes just to learn how to fish the vegetation because it's daunting at first. Mm-hmm. 
there's so much of it. It's really daunting at first. Once I started putting the pieces of the puzzle together, the Makes bells sense. went off and it translated from Florida to New York. No matter what Grass Lake I'm on, it translated. So that's the that's the key. You need a place where it's versatile enough where you could figure a lot of yeah. things out. And you can get feedback. All right, let's go back to the Sunline Hotline. Hey, you're on with Uncle Frank. Who are we talking with? Hey, Matt, it's Pringle. What's up, Zach? I was out here on Lake Norman this morning for a couple hours for go to work. Nice. Zach, uh, <laughs> Zach's who I stayed with uh, for the Bassmaster Open on Lake Norman. Outstanding. I'm kind of jealous, dude. Norman's one of my favorite fishermen. <laughs> Two questions. All right, hit him with it. First one is, what does he do on a lake Norman in the summer on, like, the south end in the clear water where he probably likes to stay? <laughs> All these useless skunk grass is what we call it. Start to grow in the and you try to skip a dock, you throw a jig or something under there, and you get grass on it. You, you just go lighter. You just need to swim something higher in the water column. Because with live scope now, we can usually see if they're holding tight to the bottom, you know, what part of the water column they're in. But you just skip something in there, and you feel like you're wasting the cast because as soon as it touches the bottom, it just gets covered in junk. That's the first question. Like, how does he approach that, and what would he do to make an adjustment in that situation during the summer when junk's growing on the bottom? Second one would be, He's got experience on Carr Lake, Kerr Lake, Bugs Island. Well, how would he how would he approach that with no wind the first weekend of October? You wouldn't by chance having to have a uh, tournament the first weekend of October. <laughs> Kerr, <laughs> no, no, not at all. Just Randall, curious I'm on that. that. <laughs> all right, thanks, dude. I pre- you're actually on the water fishing right now. Yeah, we've been. My buddy's in town. He works out of state doing lineman stuff. So it took four hours. We've had nice weather this week. Got on some schooling fish and it's been just just goofing off. We've caught probably twenty fish, no biggins. I'm jealous, Zach. All right, thanks for the question. Uh, hang up and then we'll let uh, Uncle Uncle Frank tackle both of those. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Frank. All right, you got it. Bud. That is uh, Zach. So okay. Zach has uh, season tickets to the Panthers, and a week before Baker Mayfield got traded, he sold his Panthers Browns tickets. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going into football right now anyway continue we are not so going first into one was uh okay. he's this is interesting because i think this takes place on a lot of lakes across the country is that it does. junk grass on the bottom it's green slime is what it is and it's actually a um it's not a true grass it's an algae it's green slime so the minute something touches the bottom your bait's co- totally engulfed in this green slime crud and it's a pain in the neck so basically there's two ways that i fish the docks that time this time of year i use a shallow running crankbait like a big o style bait that won't touch the bottom for me so it'll run mid column on the boat docks most of your better boat docks as you know are going to have deeper water on them um, you're going to catch a mixed bag of spots and large mouth, but the big O is nice because it dives down about four feet. And so I can keep it off the bottom because I'll put, I'll have one big O rigged on 12, one big O rigged on 14. The 14 will keep me a little bit shallower. So if I f- come up to the shallower docks, I'll throw the 14 pound. If I do come to a deeper dock, I'll throw the 12. The other thing I like to do there, and, th- and this is a mat, this is a Matt Pangrak technique is, you know, I'll skip a wacky style dinger on a flick shake, a real light flick shake, like a one thirty second or a three thirty second underneath the docks um, and a swim jig. Uh, Norman's really good swim jig dock lake. So, you know, the, that keeps your bait off the bottom. You're getting mostly reaction strikes on the crankbait in the swim jig and, and, you're getting the finicky bites on the, you know, on the flick shake with the dinger. As far as Kerr goes, um, October. October. You're talking, you're talking about the first week of October. No so, wind. He's got that advanced forecast pulled up. Yeah, no wind. So here's the thing, okay? Your bait fish are making their creek migrations. They're going to have a lot of bait fish schooling up in the creek mouths. Um check the spoon bite underneath the bait it may be a little late for that 
but it depends what the summer weather is. If your summer has been seasonally warm down there, it could stall that migration a tiny bit, and you could get some really good spoon action under suspended bait fish. Um, the other thing I like, secondary points, football jigs and Carolina rigs, and um, I crankbait that lake a lot. Um, if you really want to know the truth, um, the best crankbait I throw is the the deep little end in lavender shad. Uh, let me see. Do I have one up here in lavender? I have a DD-22 in lavender shad. Here it is. Lavender shad is a Kerr Reservoir killer. Deep little end. And so basically I'm going to concentrate on chunk rock points. The re Here's how you know you're in the right place on Kerr. If you're dragging that football jig down or you're dragging the Carolina rig down, as soon as it starts to want to snag up all the time, you're in the right rock. Remember, that time of year, those bass, they could already be migrating up into the backs of the creeks. So you have to figure out how far along they are. Um, without being there, I can't tell you that. But I can tell you that I have a lot of success on the secondary points doing the stuff I just mentioned. Um, but you still have to be, keep them honest. <clears throat> and you still got to check some of the backs of some of the smaller pockets because you don't want to get burned on that. <clears throat> Good and stuff. You, and you can. Good stuff. All right, let's go back to the Sunlight Hotline. It's now on fire. All right, you're on with Uncle Frank. Who's, who are we talking with? Hey, Matt. Hey, Frank. It's Doug from Ohio. Uh, I was just curious on, um, <clears throat> does, uh, as the uh, fall is a, coming uh closer um does the flipping bait kind of go away um do you slow down the action or do you increase the action do you increase your weight um or do you just switch to a moving bait as the temperatures drop and the grass uh starts to die uh if you can kind of help me out on that i appreciate it thank you matt uh, right. thank you frank thanks Bye. for the sh thanks for the call all right good question what about this flipping punching grass all this stuff as the water temperature cools and it becomes fall okay. it's better doesn't it at times it does um it absolutely does so here's what i do um i will have my norman fat boy because towards the middle of august i always have a fat boy tied on because the square bill bite can be insane um, I don't put my punching, I mean, not punching, I don't put my flipping stuff away because now the bass are going to start to come to the bank and any hardwoods that you see on the bank, leaners, et cetera, are going to be prominent places to pitch and flip. So I'll have my, I'll have a top water on, I'll have my fat boy on and I'll have a, a flipping stick with me. Um, traditionally, uh, I stick with the money craw, spine craw. Uh, for flipping most of the time. I don't make it complicated. Um, if you're on a true grass lake, I still fish the deep grass. Even in the fall, I fish the deep grass. But you're going to want a topwater tied on too. All right. I think that was a good group of Sunline Hotline questions, don't you? Yeah, I do. I do. We'll, we'll incorporate that more into the... Uh into the show moving forward for the remainder of the year now that we've got that dialed in. I feel like Greg Gutfeld here with my Those are all your Sharpie notes. and my impressive. notes. <laughs> well, I'm what happened? Go ahead. I was just saying, I'm telling you what, you have the notes combined with that artistic rendering that you had, and that's like a perfect, I don't know. <laughs> I think that, that would be a perfect man cave edition. But. Yeah, I have literally... I, as the show goes, I write down things like when people like Matt, when you say stuff, a lot of times you, you'll spawn an idea in my head. So I write down, take it over here or go this way with it or go that way with it. That was, um, a, that was a killer show, man. Like I learned a lot. I learned a lot. That's why I was so excited. I wasn't trying to just show me catching the few no. fish that I have caught. I was like, holy cow, you're showing the stuff that I did. And now I understand right. why. But those, and if I can catch them out of the grass, anybody can catch them out of the grass. But friend. see, the the videos are important because it puts it puts it puts the picture in place. You know what I mean? It, as you describe something like you know showing whatever drawing we showed, wherever I put it, I just moved everything. Like showing this one here, 
um, and then you put up that one video, that's exactly what you were looking at almost. Yep. You know what I mean? And so what it does is it, it, it really completes, it completes the lesson basically. Um, so I love the videos because that, and it also opens up things for me too. Um, the purpose of today's uh, show was to help you guys break down these massive grass areas to help you break them down faster, to make your day on the water more efficient, because you could spend a lot of time fishing nothing and not catching anything. And you get um, the same thing with structure fishing. I, I know guys that go out and they fish offshore and they hit two spots, don't catch anything, and they're right back on the bank. And I know guys that do the same thing in the grass. They start going down a grass edge an hour, they don't catch anything, and they're doing something else. Mm-hmm. Um, where really what it is, it's like understanding what that environment's telling you and trying to just find percentage spots to fish. That's really what fishing is. You're looking for a pattern and you're finding high percentage areas. Pretty much. I like it. Hook them for Hook Haley em. auction. Auction. Get on that auction site. I don't know when it ends. That's my bad, guys. I'm sorry. But there's a lot of new stuff guys came out of the woodwork donating for that auction so you want to check it out uh the diy section on lure net get your mm -hmm. authentic body blanks to paint um you got any new videos out yet on on the youtubes nothing since the last video post color seven there's the oblig uh, obligatory color seven <laughs> When's the yeah. color seven coming out? It's coming, guys. We're really close. Just trust me. Just be patient. We're really close. <laughs> All right. This has been day four, number 81, with the man Frank Scalish, an in-depth dive into the many types of floating vegetation and how to capture bass from underneath them. We're getting closer to 100. We'll see you guys next Thursday.